The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? For 10 years, I was the pastor of a church next door to a state university. We saw many Christians become uh, many students become Christians, and I personally mentored quite a lot of them. It was a really encouraging time. Well, that is until I made two really disturbing discoveries. The first disturbing discovery was this, that the faith of many of the finest leaders of the Christian groups on campus at that time was not sustained beyond their years at university, especially if they moved from one city to another to find work and lost touch with their peer group. They dropped out of church involvement. They dropped out of involvement with other Christians. They no longer expressed the same kind of vital Christianity they had when they were at university. That disturbed me. And to try and find out more about the background to that, I uh, did a survey, spoke to a hundred Christians, doing in-depth interviews, asking them about their faith and their life at work and the issues that they faced. And that's when I made my second disturbing discovery. Where among a number of other things that I discovered, I found that actually most Christians don't think that their work does matter to God. If they're involved in the helping professions, which many Christians are, that kind of work matters to God. But people are involved in other professions, engineers, financiers, uh, people involved in IT work, in manufacturing, in merchandising, and a hundred other different trades and professions, most of those people don't think that their work in itself matters to God. The largest mission force that the church has is mobilised every day of the week in the world as people go about their daily work. But we very rarely intentionally resource the people of God for this missionary encounter. In fact, most Christians don't even understand it to be a missionary encounter in that sense. And worse than that, I think, unwittingly as churches, we often really imply that Christian work is really about what we do with our spare time rather than what we do most of the time. That was crystallised for me when I read the words of a man, Calvin Redekop, many years ago, and he said, people spend about 40% of their waking hours at work. By contrast, most Christians spend less than 2% at church during their working years. But the church puts most of its energy into that 2% and almost nothing into the world of work. Those words have haunted me now for 20 years, uh, but also motivated me too. Actually, they're not too different in some ways from the words of uh, Tom Nelson when he says, for many years, I was guilty of pastoral malpractice because I failed to help the people that I was ministering to connect the professions of their Sunday worship with their, the practices of their Monday work. Now, I never put it as boldly or as honestly, I don't think, as Tom has. I don't think I saw it quite as clearly as Tom did at that time. But what I do know is I felt the same kind of self-consciousness as a pastor about the deficiencies of my practice at that point in time. And I really wanted to know more. In particular, I wanted to go and look at where a church is doing it differently that I can learn from. 
And so for 20 years now, I've been moving around churches in New Zealand and Australia and Great Britain and North America, trying to look for examples of where are people doing it differently that really does help to forge stronger connections between Sunday and Monday and to resource the people of God for their ministry in daily life. I've written up a lot of that. You'll find it, if you want, in a, church, in a paper called The Equipping Church on the theologyofwork.org website. But knowing that I've been interested in that research, you won't be surprised then that earlier this year when I got the invitation to participate in another survey, this time in North America, to try and understand what's the state of play in churches here now, that I was really interested to do that. And Will Messenger, who heads up the Theology of Work project and myself, we spent nine weeks travelling through 12 different American cities and talking to 70 people in in-depth interviews, plus a series of workshops as well, trying to understand how is it for people now and what are some of the challenges that confront us now to take this further. I want to talk briefly about, we discovered a lot of things and from a lot of different people, but particularly I want to recount some of the observations that were common to the experiences of pastors and churches that we talked to. <clears throat> the first thing was the people who engaged most strongly with these issues we found were the people under 40. That for a younger generation of people, these issues resonate strongly. But sometimes with a slightly different emphasis to traditionally, I think it's not just uh, overcoming the sacred secular divide. And, uh, and the kind of dualism that's part of the way we separate faith and work, but it's about integrating a life full of pressures that come at us from different directions. And how does our calling as Christians sit at the centre of the tensions that we feel between family life, competing with work life, competing with church life, competing with our involvement in the community? How do we live one life? It's not just about how do I make meaning of my paid job, it's about how do I make meaning out of my whole life's work and integrate that. And will the church be just another set of competing time demands in the midst of that mix, or will church offer part of the glue that helps us to make meaning and integrate one life? serving Christ in everything that we do. The second thing that we discovered was uh, when we asked the question, so how did you get interested in this, uh, these faith and work kind of concerns, was the narrative that followed was like a conversion story from almost everyone. who said something like, well, I'd thought about these things vaguely before, but uh, then I went to hear this speaker or I went to this seminar and suddenly it was like the scales fell from my eyes and I saw for the first time this is really important and I can't ignore it any longer. And then what followed was generally a person read a book, they listened to a sermon series, perhaps they participated in a small group uh, study, series of studies about these issues or they went to some other seminars. And if they were really grabbed, then they tried to initiate other people into the same process. So there was this recurring cycle of things. And as they talked about what they had learned, there were some common denominators there too. What, uh, this is what Will and I came to talk about as Faith at Work 101, and other people have used this uh, terminology too. But for us it was about my work really does matter to God. Our God is a worker, and we're workers made in the image of God. Our work can be a participation in God's work and God's mission in the world. Work is not just about a job, not just about a career. Work is about our Christian calling integrated with our working lives. God's given us gifts. And those gifts say something about the kind of work that God has prepared each of us to do. And our work and our worship are connected. 
These were the foundations of kind of a basic theology of work. Faith at work, 101, if you like. But then there's another question that arises, which is, where to now? Where do you go beyond 101? What does church beyond 101 look like? Because as we looked at it, almost every church, every marketplace ministry has developed its own 101 syllabus and keeps on marketing that particular view. But but to take church beyond 101, what would that look like? I haven't got time to say much, but I want to say just three things in this regard. And the first thing is this. Church Beyond 101 is not just about what's special. It's about what's normal. Because when we first think about addressing these kind of issues, we think about a special sermon on the theology of work, a special series exploring faith and work and the connections there, a special service that we can have that kind of enshrines these things. But those things may be good in themselves, but they're only a starting point. The thing that really shapes the character of people and the culture of congregations is not the special things. It's the things that we, the practices that we repeat every week and that actually drip feeding into the system, change the DNA of the organism. So the question is what's normal? It's not whether we're preaching about work on the basis of those 10 or 12 passages that we usually think of when we think about what does the Bible say about work. It's really about preaching every week from the Bible and making connections with our working lives. It's about those 859 plus passages that the theology of work commentary comments on and that we can kind of explore each time we're preaching. It's about the prayers that are prayed every week, not just about a special commissioning service on a particular occasion or because all Labor Day is coming around again. Let's do something about faith at work now. It's about the prayers that are prayed every week and whether they elevate the daily ministry of the people of God and seek to help them discover where they fit in God's mission and pray God's blessing on everyone as they serve God in whatever sphere they are. It's about the songs that we sing every week, and this is a challenge, because how many songs do you know that really forge strong links between Sunday and Monday these days? The Wesleys knew, Luther knew, but what about now? I don't think there are a lot, but if we take this stuff seriously then it will be in the songs that are sung because that's the theology that keeps on buzzing around in our heads during the week as we rehearse the words of those songs because of the music that's associated with them. So it's not just about what's special, it's about what's normal. Secondly, it's about whose faces are seen, whose voices are heard, Whose stories are being told? Is it regular Christian people fronting up and given space to actually tell their own stories? Or on the other hand, is it religious professionals like myself telling other people's narratives? Now, I'm not suggesting that other people have to do most of the preaching, but I do think a regular element has to be giving a higher profile to people who represent the grassroots of the church. It can be through short video clips, it can be through short interviews and services, it can be through just people reflecting on some other aspect of life and only for a minute or two in a service, but the faces of regular workplace Christians have to be seen in the congregational setting, the small group settings and the Christian education settings that we're involved in. Their voices need to be heard. Their stories need to be told. Only then will this stuff really get connected by people who readily identify with those who are speaking, the context they come from, the language that they use. And the third thing I'd want to say is this. I think churches beyond 101 are rediscovering the ministry of vocational guidance. 
Now, vocational guidance was once a ministry of the church, helping people find where they fit it in God's purposes and resourcing them for it. Unfortunately, it became reduced to just finding people who were pursuing religious vocations so that they were involved in the life of the church in that way. Now, as a result, it's become a purely secularised industry and it's only about helping people find jobs. But what about if vocational guidance from God's perspective is part of a much bigger dream? It's about helping all the people of God all of the time be reminded where they fit in the mission of God, backing each other to make a difference for God and being resourced for the encounter with the world that comes in the course of their daily lives. And what about if this applies at every age and stage of life, from the cradle to the grave, so that this could be as real? Think about this. If the teaching, the preaching, the worship, the mentoring, the other aspects of Christian education, if they make sense to the kindergarten child who's discovering who am I in God and how do I participate in the purposes of God and what might it mean for me to live like a Christian? <clears throat> Through the adolescent, the person venturing out into the workplace post-university, the person at midlife who's kind of rethinking where they fit in God's purposes, or the person later in life who's trying to figure out what's the work that God's prepared for me now to do? These churches have begun to see that everything they do helps to fulfil this ministry of vocational guidance for all the people of God so that everyone knows my work matters to God. In fact, knows my whole life's work matters to God. This is much bigger than just our jobs. These are churches that I believe in a variety of ways are pressing home the message that I think is enshrined in the blessing that I want to finish with, which says this. You are God's servants. And you have been gifted with dreams and with visions. And upon you rests the grace of God like flames of fire. So love and serve the Lord in the strength of his spirit. And may the deep peace of Christ be with you. And may the strong arms of God enfold you. And may the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you in every way. And in everything that you do. Every day. Amen.